Um, compassion for yourself um, is the third step. And I, here's another story. I, I always took the uh, fr biblical phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, concentrating on the first one, love your neighbor. But uh, the late Rabbi Albert Friedlander pointed out to me that it's as yourself that is important. If you can't, in some way, love and accept yourself, you're going to be harsh with other people. And he grew up in Nazi Germany and was obviously appalled at the propaganda that was coming out against Jews. One night, he lay awake, he was eight years old, and he said to himself, I am not what they say. I have my faults. But I have talents too, and I have good qualities. And he made himself lie in bed and list them one by one. And he did great good in the world. And he always said he could have done nothing at all if he had not taken himself in hand at that moment and seen himself whole. Because very often we inveigh against faults and failings that we're secretly aware of we've got ourselves. Uh, you know, we often dislike in others things, qualities that we most dislike about ourselves. And uh, we all have a dark side to us, a shadow side, as the Jungians say. Uh, it, for services in dreams and fantasies and uh, rages that we have or frustrations or terrors, particular phobias. Uh, and we've got, everybody has this. You know, everybody has it. And suffering is something that links us all. We are all in pain. Now, in a privileged country like this, our pain must seem absolutely trivial uh, compared with the global suffering that we see, but it matters to us. And if we dismiss our own pain as, you know, pull yourself together, etc., cetera, uh, if you dismiss your own pain, you're likely dis to dismiss the pain of others. Whereas once you've recognized your own pain, noticed it, uh, those things that make you wake up in the night, that make you wince years after the event, that, uh, oh, I wish that hadn't happened, uh, then uh, you and realize that everybody else has these areas of pain, even our enemies. Uh, you begin to see that suffering is the bond, as the ancient Greeks knew, that pulled us all, all together. You tell a lovely story. And I just want to check time here. Are we, um, we're good to, Tina, I'm going to ask for your help. Five more minutes. Okay. Five more minutes, OK. Because when Karen Armstrong talks, I get quite engrossed. So you know, we'll be here till like 1230, and I'll still be asking questions. You, um, to touch on that point, you paint a picture of what it was to gather and weep together in ancient Greece, in Athens, to come together and watch a play, to watch a tragedy. It was more than a night out. It was a deep spiritual, exp a deep spiritual experience for people because of this quality of shared suffering and weeping together. Why is that so potent? Well, in the fifth century, the Greeks invented the genre of tragic drama, but it was it was these plays, these tra great tragedies, Sophocles, Aeschylus, Euripides, they were performed in, as part of a religious festival, the festival of Dionysus, God of Transformation. And it was a civic duty to attend. It wasn't a matter of saying, have you caught the latest Aeschylus yet? Uh, everybody had to go. And uh, the plays usually presented one of the old myths, but slanted in such a way as to reflect the particular problems that Athens was going, having that year. And the leader of the chorus would tell the audience, now weep, weep for Oedipus, a man who inadvertently killed his father and married his mother. Someone in real life, you'd think, woo. Uh, but weep for this man in an extre extremity of agony. And the Greeks did weep. They didn't swallow hard and wipe an embarrassed tear from the corner of their eye. They wept aloud because they believed that shared suffering created a bond between people. It shows you that you're not alone in your pain. And one of the first of these plays to come down to us 
is the first, is The Persians by Aeschylus. And it was written five years after the battle, or six years, seven, after the Battle of Salamis, which, uh, at which the Greeks had soundly defeated the Persians. But before that, the Persians had rampaged through Athens, trashed the town, vandalized homes, and destroyed all the beautiful new temples on the Acropolis. And Aeschylus now asks the audience to weep for the Persians, to see the Persians not as enemies, there's no triumph, no gloating, uh, to see the Persians as a people in mourning. Now, could we do, have done that after 9-11? Uh, and uh, also an element of self-criticism. Uh, Darius, the uh, dead, ro dead Persian emperor, his ghost appears and he says, this is all my fault. It was my hubris, my pride that made me invade Greece in the first place. And the audience would have picked that up because the Greeks themselves were beginning to invade other Greek territories, other Greek city-states, and build an empire, an exploitative empire. So the, it, there's saying, don't think you know, that we're superior. We are the same. Now, this is the sort of spirit we need today. And I just another weeping together, I know, I, I'll try and tell this quickly, uh, it finishes the book in Love Your Enemies. Yes. Brief episode from the Iliad which tells the story of one incident in the long war between the Greeks and the Trojans. In it, Achilles, the chief Greek warrior, has a quarrel with King Agamemnon, withdraws his troops from the army, great detriment to the Greek side. And in the course of this, his beloved friend and companion, Patroclus, is killed by Hector, one of the Trojan princes. Achilles goes mad with grief. He challenges Hector to a duel, kills him, in front of the royal family, the Trojan fa royal family who are watching from the walls. He then mutilates the body by tying the body, to the corpse to the end, his chariot and driving it round and round and round Patroclus' grave. Then he does this terrible thing. He refuses to give uh, Hector's body back to the family for burial. And that means that Hector's soul will never know rest. And then one night, uh, Priam, king of Troy, Hector's father, comes in disguise into the Greek camp. The old man takes off his disguise when he reaches Achilles' tent, and everybody is shocked. And the old man uh, comes and he kneels before uh, great Achilles, who's killed so many of his sons, and he embraces his knees and weeps for his sons. And Achilles looks at the old man and remembers his own father, and he starts to weep himself. He weeps now for his father, now for Patroclus, who's dead. And the, the, the sound of their weeping together fills the, it creates this bond, two enemies. And then they look up at each other, and then Pri Hec uh, Achilles takes Hector's body and carries it very tenderly over to the old man and lays it very gently in his arms, afraid that the weight will be too much for the frail old man. And then the two men look at each other, the two enemies, and each sees the other as a god. Uh, that that our enemies too are in pain. They too are suffering. And it's not the end of everything. The Trojan War goes on the next day. Mm. But there is that moment of where each looks at the other and sees the, the sacred mystery, uh, the, the, the well of grief uh, in your deadliest enemy. And back again, I think, to the be open to changing your mind. Changing you your mind. You may not know what you believe you know. And he was passionate about not giving that body back. Yeah. Uh, and, and he did. He realized that he'd lost it, basically. Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Armstrong. Thank you. Thank you.